was thinking about that statistic that Jim just gave you about 400,000 students, youth in foster care in the United States. And it still makes me a little queasy, even after three years of serving on the Foster Youth Task Force and hearing that number a lot. The reason it makes me queasy is because those are kids that are directly under a mandate of the government. The government almost is their parent. They're responsible for these kids getting what they need in order to get out into the world and to be successful. And I'm not sure that that was ever the role of our government. That was the role of parents, other family members, extended family members. But there are times in the life of the child when that can't be the reality. And so there has to be a place like the state, like our counties, that take care of these kids. So let's take a look at that 400,000 in the country. It's a pretty steady figure because about a mm, little less than 250,000 enter the system every year. And then a, a little more leave the system. So it stays pretty stable in terms of that number. And you can imagine in California with us being the biggest state that we have the biggest population of foster youth at 83,000. And then what happens when they do leave if they're of an age to emancipate, which is an interesting word, they're of an age to emancipate, then they are severed from the system and they go out into the world. So I don't really look at the word emancipation as all that positive necessarily because to me it does mean severed. Whether you like it or not, whether you're ready or not, you are emancipated from the system at a certain age or certain stage in your life. So that's what the, the Foster Youth Task Force has been concentrating on, is this group of foster youth who are getting ready to emancipate, and then that group who has emancipated. You know, I used to think, naively, maybe as a high school teacher for so many years, that the wickedest age was really middle school. How many of you would kind of agree with that? <laughs> but I think the most dangerous age is 18 to 22-ish, and why? Well, think about when you were 18. You know, all of a sudden you were what? Emancipated! You know, you know, the rules sort of loosened up a little bit. You got to try things, whether, whether uh, your parents wanted you to try them or not. And a lot of times they didn't even know. In fact, my daughters were here not long ago and I learned stories from them about their early emancipation days and I'm glad I didn't know when they were doing it. So that's a dangerous time because kids get emancipated and without the skills and the knowledge to be able to go forth and to do what they need to do to be successful and to not be harmed, what happens? They become burdens to themselves and to society. So let's talk about that. Let's take just the snapshot of those 4,000 emancipating youth in California itself. And let's break those down, because they're actually right here. See, these are my PowerPoints. Each one of these chairs represents a group of foster youth. And they're up here, and they're kind of not out there, are they? They're up here. So I want to try to represent them, and I can't do it well. But I'm going to do the best that I can to tell you about these little PowerPoints. So let's just start. Forty-six percent. So remember, we're dealing with four thousand kids. Forty-six percent do not complete high school. Let's put those on a chair. Let's, let's get them represented. Twenty-five percent. Twenty-five percent of these kids become incarcerated sometime within the first two years of their emancipation. So let's just say their sentence, just to be real about it. This is a neat one. I kind of like this one. The 70-10 one. Here's the dream. 
Seventy percent of that group have a dream and want to go to college. Ten percent go. And what's this? One percent graduate. Wow, look at that. There's a group. Sixty percent. This is why I get a little queasy about this. Sixty percent of this group emancipates or gets severed into destitution because of the skills or the lack of skills that they have and their inability to make more than about six thousand dollars a year. So talk about sustainability. That's hardly possible. So. We have a lot of this population that right away is destitute. And if you don't make any money, where do you get your clothes? Where do you get your food? How can you go to school? How can you get trained? How can you get transportation? How can you do those things that the rest of us can do? Okay, kids are kind of showing up here now. 33%. 33% of this population has no form of health insurance. What does that mean? We know what it means. We don't really even have to explain that one. But that's pretty bad. And if you are only making $6,000 a year, how can you afford to even have it? Even if you need it. And if you don't have it, then you have what? You have some chronic issues. So we'll talk about chronic issues in a minute. 50%, this is chronic. 50% of these kids suffer from chronic problems. Uh, visual problems, auditory problems, asthma. What else? Malnutrition of all things. They suffer from malnutrition. Pretty sad. Remember, this is emancipation. And this one is interesting. I don't know how they got this. But this is in the report from the Legislative Analyst Office who did a, a big study on foster youth a few years ago. This represents two times. These kids, uh, not all of them, but many of them, are said to have PTSD at twice the rate of severity as some of our returning war veterans. Think about that. I don't know what you think about, actually, the fact that foster youth, before, uh, uh, well, let's say at the point of severability, have been in an average of six different living circumstances during their lives. You can begin to see why this might be a factor for them. So we've got those kids to deal with. Can we do something about it? I think we can do something about it. I think we've looked at the literature, the research. We have some great institutions in California who are working on foster youth issues right now. And the neat thing about it is we've come up, there are lots of pillars. I mean, there could probably be 100 pillars. But our uh, task force has narrowed this down to about four cornerstones. And I'd like for um, I'd like for you to just give the charge to one person here, one person there, and one person there, and one person there, so we've got the corners of the tent. Because one of the things that we can do as a community is to provide employment. So if you'll give that to him. Makes sense. Another pillar is health and safety. And you can see from the statistics why the health and safety is so important and why we need that pillar. Another one, and I'll, I'll give you these at the same time. Another one is education. Because if 46% are not graduating, there's room for improvement, right? And the last one is permanent connections, and that's where all of you come in. I see your faces, I know many of you in here, and I know what talent you all have. And just to be able to offer to foster youth some really neat things that are in these categories, like employment. How many of you employ people? Okay, so maybe a foster youth could be employed by you. How, how many could uh, teach a foster youth about uh, how to repair a bicycle? 
or cook mom's spaghetti, or stock the pantry, or finances, how to take care of your finances. What about manners? Can somebody in here teach manners? You don't have to teach manners every day. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for all of us to, to do a little bit, because a little bit adds up to a lot in terms of this group. I'd rather have all of us doing a little bit and being involved in the lives of foster youth to give them the sense that, that this place has energy, has safety, because you know what? We can shine the light through this in terms of the conditions of these foster youth because they are our kids. If not ours, who, who's? So we can reach out to these kids in ways that we really haven't thought about. But there was a slide for the last presenter that had all kinds of bartering, teaching things. The stuff that I nag about with my kids. But if you don't have a nagging mom around, maybe you don't get all that stuff. How to dress, how to introduce yourself, how to act in a group. Those are simple things. And each one of you in here has a talent. Each one of you in here, I'm asking you, come forth and join us and help a foster you shine that light on this system. I thank you very much.